Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Before I begin today's lesson, I have a question. If I want to know about God, where do I look? In the Bible. The Bible tells me I can look at what God made and I can figure out there is a God. I can figure out he's big and strong, but that's all I can know. If I want to know if God loves me or what sin is or how to get to heaven, I have to look in the Bible. Well, we are almost uh, through the book of Acts. We have several weeks left, but we're to the end of the book. And so we are finally to the section of Acts where God is going to fulfill what he promised would happen to Saul, who became Paul, when Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. God had given a prophecy through Ananias as he had laid his hands on Saul to receive his sight. And he had said, that Saul would be a light to the Jews, to the Gentiles, and to the kings of the Gentiles. And so for most of the book of Acts, we've watched why Paul has indeed been a light to the Jews. We've watched while he's been a light to the Gentiles. But up to this point, Paul had not interacted with the kings of the Gentiles. But God has a plan for how he is going to get the gospel to the leaders of the Roman Empire. And it's not going to look like Paul's first three missionary journeys. On his first three missionary journeys, he was able to move about how he wanted. He was able to go in and out of cities fairly freely and follow the spirit of Jesus. But now the tides are going to shift. But what we want to remember as we go through today's lesson, as we've said before, who's in charge? Jesus. And Jesus had warned both Paul and the churches ahead of time that there was trouble ahead, but they weren't supposed to panic because this is God's method to get the gospel to the next place. So we're going to repeat a few verses from our last lesson just so we can remember where we were, and then we will launch into today's. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 30. So the whole city was aroused. People came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They drug him from the temple and immediately the gates are shut. And while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. And when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he'd done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing, some another. And since the commander couldn't get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed him was shouting away with him. And as the soldiers were about to take him into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists into the desert some times ago? And Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city please let me speak to the people. And having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd and they were silent. And he began to speak to them in Aramaic. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. And when they heard him speak in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. 
I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. At noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And my companions saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of him who spoke to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, go to Damascus and you'll be told all you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words of his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance, and I saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately, because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing them. And the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul till he said this, and then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. And as they were shouting, throwing off their cloaks and kicking up dust, into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. The commander ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks and directed that he be flogged in question in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? And when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked, this man is a Roman citizen. So the commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. And the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. And those who were about to question him immediately withdrew. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. And that is where we're going to stop for today's lesson. So this is not what we expect as the readers of Acts, but this is what God had said would happen, right? Paul would suffer in Jerusalem. Something would go wrong and it doesn't take long. It's not even a week and what God said it happened would happen. And so Paul is innocently in the temple. He's not done anything wrong. He is drug out to this angry mob. And as Paul is being dragged next door to the fortress of Antonia to be put in the Roman barracks right next to the temple, 
he asks the commander for permission to speak to the crowd and the commander gives him permission, which is miracle number one. And so Paul takes the opportunity to speak to the angry crowd. But he speaks in Aramaic, which is the language of the crowd, but it's not necessarily the language of the Roman commander. As you can see later, the Roman commander doesn't seem to understand what was being said, but the crowd does. So this is what's so interesting to me. If you were almost beat to death outside the temple on a false accusation about bringing a Greek into the temple, you would think you would be responding to the crowd and saying, hey, I didn't bring a Greek into the temple. I'm a Roman citizen. You can't beat me. Something, right? But is that what Paul says to the crowd? No. Paul realizes this might be his last chance to speak to the Jews of Jerusalem. And so he is going to take advantage of his last chance. And so what does he want them to know in his last chance to tell them the story of Jesus? And so he begins by telling them who he was, how he met Jesus, and then what changed. And the reason he does this is so important, okay? He could have spent the time justifying himself. He could have spent the time trying to argue with the Roman commander, but he wants to make sure that everyone in the crowd hears the gospel and knows the path to Jesus so that they can follow it, so that they can have the same experience of how to meet Jesus. So let's go through this section. And remember, this is his last chance to speak to this crowd. So these are our important words. He starts by explaining to them how he came to Jerusalem as a child. He was brought up under Gamaliel, which would have immediately grabbed all of their attention because if they didn't know who they were rushing out of the temple and beating, as often people in large mobs don't know, they're just following the mob. He reminds them, I was a student of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of the most famous rabbis in these days. He's still one of the most famous rabbis in Jewish history. And so he had a famous teacher, but not only was Gamaliel famous, Saul had been famous because he had been one of the lead people in persecuting the way as it was called back then. Now, you have to remember, he's giving this speech about 20 years after he has been saved. And so he, it's been a while. Not everyone in the crowd experienced these things. So he's reminding them of what was happening in those days. And he's also letting those who weren't born yet in those days know what he was like. He was a persecutor of the way. He was zealous for God, and he was zealous to get rid of anyone who followed Jesus. And he was so zealous, remember, he'd been willing to go to Damascus, which was outside of Israel, to track down followers of Jesus and get rid of them. But although that was what Saul's heart was, and that was what Saul wanted to do, God still loved Saul. And he met him where he was on that road to Damascus. You remember this from a previous lesson. And Jesus himself confronted Saul about what he was doing, blinded him, and then provided a way for Saul to be saved. So Saul goes into the city, he's blind, and he has to start facing the facts that although he didn't think Jesus was the Messiah, He's just met the risen Jesus on the road. Jesus is the Messiah. And so as he's sitting there day after day blind, thinking through these things and this confrontation, God sends Ananias to come speak to Saul and restore Saul's sight. So here comes another miracle. Saul's sight is restored. And he says this, okay, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know and see the righteous one and to hear the words of his mouth you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard and what are you waiting for get up be baptized wash your sins away calling on his name this is a summary of the gospel repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul has been preaching now for years as he's gone to every new place, right? This is how you get to know Jesus. And so he's telling them, this is the way you must repent of your sins. You must believe that Jesus is the Messiah and you will be saved. And then he even continues and said that God had a more of a plan for Saul than to just be saved. His plan was for him to be a witness to the whole world. And so he's ready to follow and he wants to start in Jerusalem with the people who knew him. But God says, no, no, you must leave Jerusalem immediately. They won't accept your testimony about me. Go, I will send you to the Gentiles. Now, what is amazing to me about this section is how long the crowd listens. The crowd listens all the way through this whole speech until he gets to the part where he says, I'm going to preach the Messiah to the Gentiles. They're even willing to listen about Jesus. But the thing they cannot stand is that God wanted to save more than Israel. He wanted to save the world, including all those Roman soldiers who had come flooding down the steps into the temple to rescue uh, and stop the mob. Those people, God loved them too. And the Israelites could not stand it. And so this is where they stop listening. They throw their cloaks down. They're ready, even with the Romans there, to carry on the job of killing Paul. And so as Paul's being drugged into the barracks, um, the commander wants to know, what in the world did you say? What did you do that got this crowd so angry again? They're still willing to attack you, even with Roman soldiers present. But instead of just asking, he decides to have Paul flogged and questioned. Now, again, Rome is in charge of Israel at this point. They are not their own boss. And so in Rome, if you had a person who was not a Roman citizen, this was standard. You didn't have to treat them like a citizen. You could do whatever you wanted, including flogging without a trial to get questions answered. But as Paul's about to be stretched out to be flogged, he says, hey, is this legal? I'm a Roman citizen. And they didn't expect that. They did not expect him to be a Roman citizen. And so often we've seen in Acts, there's other times like the jail in Philippi where Paul does not use his citizenship first, but this time he does. He pulls that card out right away. I am a citizen, is this legal? Because he wants to get the attention of the Romans who are there. So at the end of this section, the whole reason this is here, along with all the things Paul said, is because this matters, okay? This is Paul's last chance to make sure that his own countrymen have heard the gospel. And then pretty well for the rest of the book of Acts, Paul's not going to have access to preaching to the Jews anymore. He's going to be in Roman custody. And so I wanted you to see Paul's bravery in talking to an angry mob but also his heart, his heart is not anger at the Jews. It's begging them one last time to consider the gospel, to turn to Jesus and to be saved. That's his heart. No matter what the Jews do, no matter how often they've beaten him or thrown him in prison or chased him out of town, his heart to the Jews has remained soft. He wants his countrymen to be saved. And we want to make sure that our hearts stay like that too. When there's people that we're sharing Jesus with and they don't want to hear and they are angry and they are persecuting, it's not easy to stay soft in our hearts towards them and to want their salvation. It gets real easy to say, I don't want to reach these people anymore. But for Jesus sake, this is a good example of how we keep our hearts soft and we keep sharing the gospel, even when they don't want to hear it, so that they have a chance, a chance to be saved. Because if they don't hear the gospel, there's no other way for them to be saved. So it's not an easy lesson, but it's an important one. And it should help us to really consider how do I respond when the people who 
I'm sharing Jesus with don't want to hear? Do I remain soft and humble? And do I keep praying for them? And do I keep trying to tell them the truth? So thanks for listening. And I look forward to seeing you next week as Paul has his last meeting with the Sanhedrin.